Hi, I'm Tom Landon from Blue Ridge PBS and Echo, and I want to welcome you to a very special program produced by our own Sadie Hartzog. It's the second in our occasional series called Field Notes, which captures live performances shot on location. In 2016, Roanoker Lee Hunsaker had a vision of a curated live storytelling event for Southwest Virginia. A writer who comes from a long line of storytellers, Lee started by hosting a series of small events and the word grew. Called Hoot and Holler, the stories usually follow a theme, which can be anything from tales about first dates, frenemies, salvation, or even a life in drag. The program you're about to see was recorded at the historic Grandin Theater in November of 2021, and the theme for the night was serendipity. It features tales of loss, love, and travel. Warning, these stories are told by grown-ups for an audience of grown-ups and may feature adult situations, so we've tried to take care to bleep any words that you might find offensive. The parents may want to watch the stories first and decide if they're appropriate for children. Finally, the views expressed in these stories are those of the storytellers alone and may not reflect the opinions or attitudes of Blue Ridge PBS or Echo TV. Storyteller number one. He makes his home in Callaway, Virginia, barely a mile from where his ancestors settled in 1740. His varied career has led him through advertising agencies in New York City, presidential campaigns in Iowa, and now a retail gift shop, Big Lick Gifts at Valley View Mall. You've got to check it out, it's awesome. Joe is an avid genealogist in his spare time. He has traced several lines of his family back to the 700s. He says, it's not the pedigree you look at, but the stories of each person through time who contributed to who and where you are. Please welcome first time storyteller, y'all, extra love, Joe Stanley. Um, thank you all for having me, and just a shout out to Tina Turner, she'll be 83 this year. So. I never wanted children. I, I mean, I never wanted children. Has anyone here tonight, show of hands, ever met a child? <laughs> ah, they're extra. I mean, it's a lot. It's a lot to take. In 1994, I left the Valley, and I was living in New York City, living the dream that I had meticulously planned. I mean, I was, I was coasting along. Then, in 2002, my sister, my mother, and my grandmother died in a six-month period. Wow. It was a rough period. It was tough. We have a thing in our family called alpha one any trips and deficiency syndrome. And it killed my sister, it killed my mother. Melissa, my sister, left behind a 16 month old little girl named Mary. Um, Mary's biological father had chosen not to be a part of her life. And with a single phone call, I became a single parent. It was tough. And I, I'm not afraid to say at the time that I looked at everything as though it had to do just with me. Look what I lost. Now, I'll also gladly say, God bless her, I'm an unashamed mama's boy. My mother, although she would never hesitate to correct you if you were wrong, she made us feel, she made me feel like every day the sun rose just to see my shining face. My sister used to say, you think you're the center of the universe. And? <laughs> I mean, is it so bad for you to just be a planet? <laughs> she would then say, she's not a planet. And I would say, that's odd. Your face looks like Uranus. <laughs> My mother could love you in a way that the prospect of living without that made it futile. Why would you want to? I, I couldn't see myself going on without my mother. And I always asked myself, 
myself, why me? Why was this happening to me? What did I do? What could have I possibly have done to deserve this kind of loss? Well, my, I had Mary to take care of, and that kept me going for a bit, but if I'm honest, my, my caring for Mary was just a distraction from my own self-pity. And boy, did I wallow in it. And when I thought about taking care of Mary, I could only see in the future, and I could only see me, and I thought, well, how does this, how does this person ever even look at me and not see only what she lost? I mean, let's face it, I'm the world's worst consolation prize. <laughs> so I prayed and I cried, and I prayed and I cried, and I asked for understanding, and eventually I began to doubt my faith. Um, and then I reconciled myself to end it. I decided I was going to kill myself. And I had a plan. I knew exactly what I was going to do. And the day came. And I laid there in my bed that morning and I cried. I sobbed. God, help me. Just, just tell me what to do. Please help me. Get up. <laughs> Get up. Well, now, I had put Mary's bedroom at the end of a short hall just for mine, and I placed her bed so that we could see each other. Get up. And I, I turned my head, and I looked down towards her room, and there was Mary, standing in her baby bed, with her arms hanging over the side, telling me to get up. Uh, and, and this wasn't a baby's voice. This was something otherworldly. This was a command to get up. So I got up. And I'm crying harder than I was ever crying. And I walked down the hall towards her room. And as I walk in her room, she says it one last time. Get up. And as I get close to the baby bed, her arms go out. She becomes a toddler again. And she says, love you. So I stop praying to die. Now, I'm a hot and cold kind of person. There's not a whole lot in me that's lukewarm. So if I wasn't going to die, I was going to be the best damn parent you've ever seen. <laughs> so good, they can make a documentary about me. This is the kind of parent that needs to be preserved for posterity ages from now. People want to look and learn from me about how to be the best parent. I have a master's degree in education from New York University. I've read all the books. I mean, all the books. I knew exactly what to do. I will say I was a little bit disappointed to find out Mary had not read the books. <laughs> And unfortunately, she had no clue how to respond to what was my perfect parenting. <laughs> well, my, Mary and I fell into a routine, and things were getting better, little bit by little bit. One of my most prized possessions is from one of my first father's days. And the teacher had asked them to what they, what they loved most about their dad. And she gave them these paper donuts so that they could decorate them. And then when they were done, she wrote on the back what the child had said, and then she laminated them. And honest to God, one of my most prized possessions is a pink donut. God, it's beautiful. <laughs> I wish you guys, I should have brought it with me. And on the back it says, I love my dad because he gets the poo out of my pants. <laughs> I mean, I want to know who's here to deny that's love. 
As I said, we fell into a routine, and Mary and I became partners in crime. Uh, every day with her was an adventure. Now, when my lesser angels would prevail, might be often or not, Mary took great pride in repeating every little detail of it to anyone who would listen to her. She was a sponge, if not a mirror. Mary chose to call me daddy by her own accord. Sorry. Um, Mary chose to call me daddy by her own accord. And through her own uh, clever mind and smart mouth, I became, uh, let's just say it was a working relationship with every school principal in Franklin County. <laughs> we had to have hard conversations. The kind of conversations that I can promise you, no dad ever wants to have with his little girl. But we had them. And we soon learned that we could tell each other anything. Now, I, I could tell you that Mary's adolescence was difficult, but I'm still not fully convinced that that was actually her that got back off the bus the first day of middle school. <laughs> I don't know who they sent to my house, but dear God, her moods turned like windmills. And mean. Oh, she was mean. She could say three words and cut you to the quick. But she was resilient. And Mary's resilience convinced me to, to keep going. I was once telling a friend of mine about how difficult it was with Mary at the time, at her age, and a woman nearby heard us talking and chimed in and said, yeah, we all want to raise a strong independent-minded woman. It's just a shame we have to live with them while we do it. <laughs> in high school, when Mary was in high school, her biological father died. I took her to the funeral, and there were lots of people who knew who Mary was, and we didn't necessarily know who they were. And person after person after person kept coming up, expressing their condolences. And every time someone would tell Mary they were so sorry that her dad died, she would, she'd squeeze my hand. And finally, this woman came up to her, and I know she meant well, but she said, I am so sorry. I'm so sorry that, you're, that you lost your dad. And Mary went, I didn't. It's right there. But this woman doubled down. She was ready for it, and she said, no, 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 sweetie. I meant your real dad. And God bless Mary, she said, that is my real dad. <laughs> He's the one that's been there. Mary in high school also took up to volunteer with the local rescue squad. And it was during that time that I could see her getting older and maturing, and I saw glimpses of, of the woman I knew she was becoming. In March 2018, I was headed home one night, and my tire blew out. I lost the tire off my entire car. I crossed the yellow line, and I crashed into another car, going about 60 miles an hour head on. I had often begged Jesus to take the wheel, but I never meant that one. <laughs> um, thank God the young woman that I hit was not injured as badly. She had a couple bruises and was otherwise fine. I, on the other hand, broke my legs. I had a major concussion, a huge laceration on my head. Um, I lost my eyesight temporarily, and I broke five ribs. Now the best part, the icing on that cake, is that I used to keep a little can of pepper spray on my keychain, and as the car crashed and crushed, it drove my knees into the dashboard, and I maced myself. <laughs> Good times. Good times. I don't have a lot of memories of the actual impact of the wreck, but I do I do have some foggy memories, and I remember the first one was I heard footsteps. I heard running. And I heard, that's my dad. 
And I'm sitting there and I can't see and all of a sudden I feel two hands grab my shoulder. And I hear, it's me, Daddy, it's me, it's Mary. It's Mary, I love you. You're going to be okay, it's me, it's Mary. Now let me do my job. And as faint as those memories are, I, in my head I could hear her saying, Get up! Get up! And in preparing for tonight and talking about the past 20 years, I realized that um, maybe I took the wrong cue. Mary used to come into me when I would be telling a, a story or about my mom or I was sad and she was able to comfort me in a way that only someone who had lost was able to comfort you. And I began to wonder, did I, did I ever do that for her? Yes. So I look back and I think about how selfish I was going on about me as the consolation prize and why me and what did I do? And long before I lost my eyesight in the wreck, I was blind to the gift I'd been given. You can't take away the pain, the sorrow, the grief. That's impossible. But when you're given a hand to hold while you walk through it, that's what makes life special. Thank you.